Welcome. My name is Chris Roberts. We're on a second segment of um, oral histories of Cheshire County um, veterans. Um, what we're trying to do is um, get as many oral histories of our veterans from Cheshire County, from all branches of service, World War II, um, Korea, and so forth. Some who served in, ser in country, other ones who didn't, um, served during the cold, cold War period. Some people call it Cold War, other people call it pretty hot. Um, and so that's what we're here today. We're, so we're now here with our new guest. Uh, you can tell your name. Yeah, I'm uh, Roland West. I was born and fetched up in Millinocket, Maine. Everybody calls me Roly. I'm an old geezer now. I was born in 1925. Uh, went into, uh, I had uh, one year of uh, mechanical engineering at the University of Maine and uh, got inducted in Bangor, so they said 1A, Army. I was in the Army about 20 minutes, <laughs> time enough to get down to the Navy recruiting office. <laughs> <laughs> I figured a hammock was better than a foxhole, so. Uh, so I went Navy, and uh, I had passed the Eddie test. Captain Eddie had a test. They were looking for uh, electronics uh, technicians and so forth. And uh, I passed that test, and uh, I was just, I was went to uh, boot camp in Great Lakes, and officer there said, "Anyone here had any military experience?" And I said, "Well, I had a year ROTC, <laughs> University of Maine. Good, you're you're uh, you're in charge now, <laughs> okay?" So I was uh, in charge of my outfit, going through uh, uh, boot camp training and so forth, and uh, we did pretty well. Anyway, on from there, uh, went went to electronic school took primary radio and all that sort of thing. Then went down to uh, uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, and uh, we had uh, radar training and all that sort of thing. We finished that, closed the base up, and uh, went over to, uh, this was 1944. I got out in 40, uh, uh, 46. But anyway, we went from there to, great, to uh, Texas, Corpus Christi, where we finished up graduated and so forth. I got my rate then, uh, aviation electronic technician, third class, <laughs> whoopee, wow, you know. Anyway, I was slated to go on the Forrestal, and uh, the war had ended. They had changed uh, enough things around there, and they said, we don't need you. And, uh, okay, <laughs> so I can you see can you sign really. here and finish <laughs> out your four-year <clears throat> hitch. I was USN, regular. <clears throat> Or you can sign here, here's a pen, <laughs> and uh, you can go back to college, and so, which I did. So anyway, it was, it was interesting. We had a lot of great times. I tied up with a buddy down there, a kid from, uh, uh, from uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, and he was character. He was a character. We used to call up the uh, nurses' quarters at the local <laughs> hospital down there in Biloxi and make up a couple of blind <coughs> dates and so forth. We had a good time. You know, so how does a kid from way in the backwoods of Maine hook up and have such a relationship with someone from Corpus Christi? I don't know. I was just on the right, right <laughs> spots, yeah. When I was down in Gulfport, Mississippi, I, I got a call from the uh, guardhouse. Roland West report to the guardhouse immediately. Da-da-da, you know. Oh, boy. I don't remember getting in any trouble. I got over there and... Coming in the door, there's my brother. He's uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander. So I got to salute my brother. <laughs> and, and he never returned my salute. <laughs> All I got was a big hug. Uh, he had just been, he had spent most of the war, most of the war, I think he was in about four years, something like that, back and forth on the Pacific. In the, he went to Maine Maritime Academy. He did a nice job. I'm very proud of him. Very proud of him. And uh, anyway, uh, I didn't contribute a whole lot to the war. The, the, you, you other guys won it. <laughs> I was in kind of the follow-up, but uh, I'm I'm still an old geezer. I'm Eighty-five years old. Eighty-five years old. Looking yeah. good for eighty-five. I'm, I'm an antique. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some antiques become more and more valuable, right? Well, I don't, yeah, <laughs> that, that sounds good. I don't know. I, I have a. <clears throat> I uh, lost my wife about four years ago. And 
Uh, that leaves you alone. I have a little charming daughter, well married and so forth, and I'm content. I love it here in Keene. We were talking, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you want to go there, but we were talking before we came on here, you were talking about an individual you knew that was a pilot, got shot down at Formosa. Yes, he was, uh, he was my roommate in college when I, when I first got there. We had a uh, nice guy, Bob, Bob Levesque, I think it was, from Maine. And uh, yeah, he was uh, uh, flying the Grumman, which is slow. just a flying engine. <laughs> you lose the, uh, you had a glide ratio of about one to one if the engine <laughs> ran, quit. Uh, he was 12 hours in the water, come out with a full body cast, and uh, <clears throat> his crew survived. And, uh, he was a character. He wouldn't even let me help him make his bunk or anything like that. I'll well, do it myself. You know, he, <laughs> poor guy. He was on 10% disability. And at the same time, we had a kid from the Army was uh, on the tennis team, had 90% disability. So it's some of the unequal things. And uh, you know how the military is. You've been in it. Well, it, <clears throat> and a lot of people keep, most people don't even know what the word Formosa means. Most people don't even know where um, Taiwan is right. on the map, and Taiwan oh. is Formosa. Yep. And yep. a lot of people don't understand was during the war and right after the war, Formosa was a pretty hot place. Not, not swinging hot, but it was pretty hot militarily. Oh, yeah, dangerous, very dangerous, yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah, my brother tells about uh, uh, he was uh, second in command on a big freighter. Because he went to Maine Maritime Academy and got his... Uh, so he was in Merchant Marines or was he in the Navy? He was uh, Maritime Service. Yeah. And, uh, but they got a Navy commission when they graduated. So he was ensign <clears throat> right out of school, and then he made lieutenant commander of the Navy. He switched over to the Navy later. But he had a Jap sub come right up alongside. They got out, looked around, everything else, got back in their sub, and never saw him again. Charlie said, this, is, this has got to be this has got to be the end here. The angel tapped him on his shoulder and said, not your time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when you, you talk about um, the, the disabilities, how, you know, the guy on the tennis team gets 90, the other one, the pilot gets shut down right. and gets yeah. 10. Inequalities. <clears throat> but sometimes, as you look, sometimes those inequalities are really self-inflicted. Because oh. when you go in and look at a lot of men and women who served during World War yeah. II, yeah. they toughed it up, and they're oh. still 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, still toughing it up yeah. and not saying, you know what, I made it back, I made uh, it back, uh, yeah. I don't need yeah. anything. Yeah. And what do you go and what do you do to, to veterans who says, you know, you did get hurt. If you're in a full body cast, yeah. those, those don't go away. Oh. You may recover temporarily, but those bones are going to hurt. Those bones are going to become arthritic oh. as you get older. Oh, uh, this is why I have such a great admiration for the Marines. I mean, uh, uh, I think of Iwo Jima. 6,812 men gave their lives so that we could have that very strategic point in the middle of the Pacific. It was, uh, I don't know, I got a few friends in the Marines, and uh, I just... <laughs> My salute, you know, really. Because we were talking before, yes, the Afghan and Iraq wars, they're long. Yeah. People don't want to pay the price. Yeah. But when you stop and realize in a six-week period on Iwo Jima, they had more casualties combined than these oh, two wars. The brutal horribleness yeah. of the wars. The Japs were dug in. They were dug in. We bombed it first and the best we could. And still, they say the they say the waves were red with American blood. It, it, uh, that gives me the creeps. Because <laughs> yeah, I don't think we blow it off the history. Yeah. D Day was brutal. We had Private um, the movie Private Ryan. Yeah. But when people, <clears throat> even um, Battle of Okinawa. Yeah. People oh. don't understand how many naval ships were sunk in Okinawa oh. between subs and kamikazes. It was tough, really tough. And we had some really brave men over there that survived the whole thing. It's, uh, you know, <clears throat> Pearl Harbor. Whoa. Horrible thing. The, um, I'm picking on you because you're 
in the Navy. Go ahead. But the <laughs> live it up. But on a good point, is, for example, the Philippines when the Japanese took over Philippines. Yeah. We had a lot of naval nurses who oh. were captured, who spent three, four years Horrible. in the POW oh. camps. Oh. And we don't talk much about them, but they did a hell of a job. They went through brutal, brutal conditions, but brutal. did a hell of a job to save a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Oh. There are people who are grandparents and parents now who would have never been there if these nurses hadn't saved their their oh. grandfather and father's lives. They did. They they were, <laughs> they did a fantastic job. They really did. Uh, it just brings to mind there was a there's a uh, I recently saw it on an email that uh, there was a, a German nurse who was sneaking babies out of the uh, out of the camps. She she was allowed to go in and, and administer mm. medical things. And, but she had this big bag that she always carried. And uh, she carried it in empty, almost empty. Mm. It had a lower compartment. Mm. And she carried out, she'd carry a baby out. She saved something, I don't know how many lives. Uh, I, I won't give the number, mm. but it was several thousand babies survived because she was brave enough to, uh, to do that. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Anyway. I like the smile on your face. You're 85. Oh, you're spry. I'm 85. Yeah. And you, <clears throat> there's no doubt that you, you're proud of the service that you put in, and you would I do didn't. it again. The other guys won the <coughs> war. They they were on the firing lines. I, I was willing, ready, willing, and able. They say, but uh, no. <laughs> I had fun one moment uh, in basic training. You had to take knot tying, you know. And we had a bosun's mate up there, and uh, here's how you do it, you know. <laughs> And he tied a square knot, a few others, and then he tried to tie a bowl, and then he had a tough time with it. And I said, sir, uh, there's a real quick and easy way to do that. <laughs> oh, we got a smart guy. All right, all right. Come up here and show me. So I went up, grabbed the rope, flip, flip, flip. There's your bowling. I mean, almost as quick as that. We had, I learned in the Boy Scouts. And he said, how'd you do that? How did you do that? I got a kick out. Anyway. We're from Maine. We're fishermen. We're supposed Damn. to know how. Well, yes, you've got to do that up there. <laughs> so life's a little different up there in Maine. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Nobody says yes, it's sure. sure. But anyway, he got a kick out of it and uh, taught him a lesson. <laughs> I want to thank you for your time. And My I'm, pleasure. <clears throat> I want to thank you for all the things you volunteer in your community. So you, your service hasn't ended. Oh, no, no. Pleasure meeting you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm here with my new guest. Dexter Guyette. And I see on your, your cover it says U.S. Navy Arm God. Right. And we'll talk about the Arm God, but I'm going to read a poem that you presented me. Yes. And I'm going to read it on your request. And it's a man from the Arm God that wrote it. Man, for, an individual from the Arm God. Who Cares by Richard Lowe. In this gun tub I sit, waist deep in snow, which once was white, but now is red, with a shipmate's boy that I now hold, once filled with life, now is dead. While he laid in his snowy bed, I felt he realized he soon would be dead, because he motioned me closer to his head, so I might hear the last two words he said, who cares, who cares. Later when they laid him at my feet, and I covered his body with a sheet, and when he slipped, and when we slipped him off into the deep, his words in my ear seemed to repeat, who cares? As I stood and watched his body disappear, this shipmate that I held in my arms so dear, the sacrifice he made will remain forever clear. He had given his life, yet he wanted to hear, who cares? Now after all these years, I look back to the day, and since that occasion, now when I pray, I thank God who allowed him those few, sec few seconds to stay in my arm so I could hear him say, who cares? It's a <clears throat> moving story. This was after an eight-day battle 
and there was 44 ships in that battle of freighters. And um, when they finally, when it was over, there was four that made it, all the rest went down. And this one of the ships that he was on. And <clears throat> which, which? It was up in Murmansk, it was in the Murmansk run. <clears throat> but the most striking point about this is the four, the four times he repeated it. Who cares? That's why it gets me too. <clears throat> and <clears throat> yes, I, I, I've served in, in the war zone. I served my 20 plus years in the military. <clears throat> and I've known a number of individuals that have passed on as a result of mili tra military training because a lot of people didn't realize four to six hundred people died every single year in military training. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what I find so, so striking is when you go ask, who cares? Well, you care about your shipmates. I care about my fellow Marines. We, we care about our comrades in arms. Right. And when you go and you see these events like Memorial Day and Veterans Day, and we have politician after politician <clears throat> go up, and then you say to yourself, do they really care? Or who cares? Right. <clears throat> Veterans Day is, is, <clears throat> is for veterans, we understand, mm -hmm. but Veterans Day is for the people to answer this question. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. The men and the women who served this country, the ones, the ones who we've had friends and comrades who didn't come back, the men and women who have come back beaten physically, mentally, without limbs, mm -hmm. they're asking a simple question. Who cares? Yes. And far too often, you'll have someone who'll go back to someone who's got a communication degree Write me a speech, give me an answer so I can answer this. Yeah. If you can't answer it from the heart, you don't care. Right. That's what this individual is saying is, yeah. who cares? Tell me from the bottom of your heart, tell me from your inner soul, do you care or don't you care? Yeah. So in some case, if you don't care, don't lie to me, don't placate to me. Yeah. Just say you don't care. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and I can live with that, but don't treat me as if I'm an idiot because my friend, my comrade, just made a tremendous sacrifice. He gave up his life for you, so yeah. don't lie. Be honest. You either care or you don't care. Yep. And the worst part is, if you care, you don't have to tell me because I can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, okay. <clears throat> I didn't mean to. No, that's okay. Go on that. That, but. It was, it was, it was, it's very moving. It is very moving, and yeah. you, could, you could feel it. And I don't think most people feel it, and unless you, one of those things, that if you haven't experienced it, you don't understand. Yep. It's the old thing, it's, we say over and over, the people who have been there don't have to say anything. It's the people who have never been there who are always trying to convince you they were there. Yeah, yeah. And so, now let's get back to um, <clears throat> the armed guard. Okay. Can you explain to people what the armed guard was? The armed guard was an, outf an outfit that's not very well known. And it's where men that had been trained special to go on freighters and man the Navy guns, the five inch and four inch and three inch, and five inch 51s and whatever. It, during, when they first put them on, they, there was an armed guard in World War I, and it was dismantled right after the war. And they finally had to do it in World War II. And so we were trained on so many different sized guns. We had to train on every position besides all these old guns. Um, and then we were put, they, whatever they could find, put on those ships. They didn't have anything ready to put on. So we had to be able to take whatever came. And um, we, we were in convoys, 
And I, I was, my first assignment was to go down to South America and on an Alcor ship was a freighter converted for an oil ship and went up 65 miles into the jungle and there was a mine up there and they, it was uh, aluminum ore and we were, sh we were shuttling between Trinidad and British Guiana and Dutch Guiana and we took two trips back to the States and brought stuff food and supplies and things back down there. I did that for six months and then I trans got transferred off of that ship onto another ship and I was in the North Atlantic for 17 months. I was in 12 convoys in the North Atlantic. And <clears throat> the North Atlantic was pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. the, the, the first couple of convoys, you didn't have the escorts. You went straight for speed. You had really yeah. old tin buckets. You That's had, right. That was before the, the Victory ships, wasn't it? No, uh, the, the Liberty ships. The Liberty ships. Yeah. Yeah, I was on Liberty ships. And um, the Liberty ship that I was on, the last one I was on, uh, we were in one of these terrible storms. I think it's re it recorded in history, one of the worst. A lot of ships were sunk. And our ship was just about destroyed. Um, we lost everything. We lost all our life rafts, smashed all our lifeboats, smashed the reels, broke the davits off, and we lost our cargo nets. And uh, the ammunition room was filled up with water, and we formed chain gangs, get rid of the water. It cracked in half right behind midships. And um, there was, the galley was full of water, went through the stoves, came down the coal chute. We were breaking waves right over by the smokestack. And so you're talking about 40 to 60 foot waves then? Yeah, more than that. The ship would completely go out of sight. The one beside you, you couldn't see the mast or nothing. And then we'd go down, and when we went down, we would look up until we couldn't see him anymore. So we, we had to break away from the convoy and go into, uh, we went through minefields. But we got in and we went into, uh, I think it was Bethlehem Steel. And they worked around the clock. They put a big belly band around it and, <laughs> and patched up some plates and stuff. And went back out again. but. Then I left the arm guard and I was transferred to the West Coast. And uh, I was on, a, on the LST 569. And I did, we moved uh, troops around. And uh, we made a beachhead with Chinese Sixth Army. And then from there we, I finished up my time doing repatriation of Chinese slaves from Japan back to China. And we put a, a thousand men, women, and children in the tank deck. There was no seats, no beds, no nothing. They sat right on the cold steel in the winter, no heat. And we cooked their rice in a rubbish barrel. And it was a five-day trip. And then we'd take Japanese soldiers from, Japan, from China and bring them back to Seisabu, Japan. And it was the same deal with them. And we couldn't give them any medica medication. Some died, some were awful sick. And I've, I've been on a number of LSTs, the Bounceable County, one of the ways in that, mostly all the Navy ships, if it's a county, it's an, it's an LST. But most people don't realize the whole back end of an LST is completely flat. Yeah. And we were going through the the Donnell Straits in, in Turkey, and a, a storm came up. Oh, yeah. And it was almost like someone, it was like Oprah Sidon was just coming up, took it, and was just slamming it down where yeah. even then the troops that I had on it was a two-day storm. They were given their sea rats, and they were tied into the racks for, yeah. for two days because 
that's how brutal a flat bottom ship is in an open yeah. storm. So I can just picture <clears throat> the moans, the groans of a thousand people making it through the South China Sea in a storm. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> how do yeah. you how do you live through that? The the, the noise in it. It's yeah. like a horror movie. It was terrible. Yeah. One guy, I heard a guy groaning, I went to find him. A lot of guys couldn't go in the tank deck because the odor was so oh, bad. The oil, the diesel. Yeah, yeah they, and they, they would upchuck. We had pails about every 10 feet, and, and that had to be dumped all the time. And the ones that were sitting on pad eyes, which is like a hump with some slots in it, so yeah. they can put the turnbuckles on. Too tight, yeah. Well, they would upchuck in it and then sit on it. <laughs> No, and they wouldn't go up to the bathroom. They'd go down by the ramp and do their business. Yeah. And um, it was kind of crude, but. It was almost like a floating cesspool by the time you get yeah. done with the trip. Yeah, we made quite a few of those <clears throat> trips. So when you went to the Pacific, was you part of the Navy or are you still part of the still Armed Still the Navy. Not part of the Armed Guard yeah. now. I was okay. So you, when you went from the Atlantic, you, you're Armed Guard. Yep. Then when you went to the Pacific, you were part of the Navy. Yeah, I was part of the Navy all the while, but on a Navy ship. And um, what was the difference between the armed guard and the merchant marines? Well, we, were, we had separate quarters. Yeah. You know, we had our own mess hall. Uh, we had no communication. I mean, there's a radio on the ship, but we didn't, there was no... There was nothing. We didn't have any medic of any kind. You had to have be in top physical condition because they, you know, they're not going to break up the convoy to come and get you. If you're over the side, you're that's over the it. Si yeah. We're not coming back. Yeah. Because, well, we, we were talking about not very many people knew about the armed guard. It took for years and years to for the country to acknowledge that merchant marines should be treated like veterans because in some cases yeah. they, they were at much greater risk of dying. Yeah. If you went down in the North Atlantic, no one was coming for you. No. You were dying in a matter of minutes. Yeah. So how has the, the government and the VA treated or looked at the armed guard individuals? They don't, nobody seems to know very much about it. You know, they, they just don't realize. I didn't, I just sent for my medical papers, and all I have is a uh, paper with, that shows the cavities in my teeth. <laughs> and then uh, the other was the physical that I had when I went in boot camp, and the physical that I had when I came out. That's, that's all they got for me. But I was lucky that I was healthy enough to manage it. Yeah. So. <clears throat> but by being in the Navy, were you able to take advantage of the GI Bill? Yeah, I went to college. But the Merchant Marines and the other ones never got the no. GI Bill because no. they were nev never considered veterans. Yep. When I was in Florida, I, I went into uh, Walmart, and there was an, a Merchant Marine guy there. And he, when I, I think I went through the register or something, and he came up to me and he talked to me about being in the armed guard, and he was in the merchant marine, and he had had his ship torpedoed and uh, sunk, and he, he was kind of weepy. And uh, I went there about once a week, you know, and I would see him, and he was just sitting on a bench somewhere, because I didn't get anything they from the government. Anything. He didn't, he, you know, he just had dungarees on, and he just, Find a while away time, I guess, or something. But I felt bad for him, you know. Because if you study back in your history, when you talk at 41, 42, up and down the um, Atlantic coast, it was called the, the shooting gallery. Basically, you went out, you were a sitting duck, yeah. and <clears throat> basically they had to shut down Coney Island and all those because the lights of New York City, Boston, Phil, just um, illuminated yeah. these ships and yeah. the German U-boat said, this is fun, this is easy. Yeah. And then we turn around and say, none of you guys who were in the Merchant Marines ever went in arms way. Yeah. But 
with the Lend-Lease Act under Roosevelt, there was no way Russia and England could have survived without, the, without, without all the time, effort, blood, and sweat, and tears that the armed guard and the merchant marines did. Yeah. They were the lifeline to keep England and Russia into the war. Right, yeah. And people, people just don't understand it because without the merchant marines and the armed guard, you would have Europe, which is Germany, and then you would have the United States. You'd have only t basically two countries left. Yeah. yeah. On the one on each side of the Atlantic. Yeah. Now the the talking about lend lease, they the uh, Liberty ships, they built twenty seven hundred of them in a very short time. Oh, Mr. Kaiser, yeah, you just pumped yeah, them right out. He did. <laughs> and they had a they had a contest, and they uh, all the shipyards in the United States. And the one that won the contest, they made it in four days, 15 hours and 30 minutes. <coughs> Seaworthy, ready to go. And that was quite a feat because it's 400 and 441 feet long and 57 feet wide, and it takes 10,000 tons in the hole, and you can put thousands of tons on the deck. So it was a pretty good ship. They thought it would only make a couple of trips, yeah. you know. <laughs> If, if yeah, you made two or three, made two or three round trips, you get the government got its money's worth out of it. Yeah. But if you were the merchant marines and you made three round trips, you're yeah. saying, hey, I'm yeah. lucky, time to get yeah. another ship. Yeah. They they traveled uh, in convoys eight knots. They were a very slow ship, just, just like the about LSTs. Ten miles an hour. Yeah. <clears throat> Took a long time to get there. Yeah. And so yeah, because the average person could walk about four. So that's only about twice walking speed. Yeah. And yeah, then you, you're sitting duck for a submarine. Yeah. yeah. So I want to thank you. Yeah. And I especially want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, read the poem. Yeah. I know I got emotional. But you know that's what? That's OK. I do. I'm not embarrassed by it no. because it was heartfelt. It, would, it meant something. Yeah. I yeah. care. You care. And I think the men and women that were here today care. And quite a few of the other people care. Yeah. And maybe some of the people listening to this, maybe they'll sit down and go, maybe I should care. Yeah. yeah. But I think one thing that I, when I think about that poem is a, a lot of people have come up to me and to say, you know, thank you for your service. Shake my hand. And it always feels so good. And I thought, you know, if when I think about who cares, I think that's a very good thing to do, especially for some that have gone through living hell, you know, <clears throat> to go up and say that to them. Yep. I had, um, <clears throat> I had wrote, I had given a speech up at, um, <clears throat> up at the State House in, in Concord. And, and one of the things I said was, not all the death is on the battlefield. No. Some people come back and they're, <clears throat> they're a living death just waiting to be put into the grave. Yeah. I, I think pe some people don't understand. No. Life is not like um, World at War where you kill up, we'll just turn the game off and reset. Whatever happens, happens, and you carry forward that yeah. the whole rest of your life. Yeah. And I don't think people understand it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people need to be able to say, you know what? I don't understand what you go through. I'm not going to go and tell you I understand what you go through. But I care that what you went through, I appreciate what you went through. And if there's any way I can help you, let me know. Yeah. There, there's just something about <clears throat> is where people go, I'm a therapist, I'm a doctor, I've read all this stuff in the book, so now I understand. No, nope, the VA has finally smartened up and created vet centers. And vet centers are for people who have been in the combat zone. Yeah. And it's run by people who have been there. Yeah. Because what good does it do to me if I have 30 years of therapy and 12 years of education? I have no idea what you went through going through a North Atlantic winter on a ship that's only going 10 miles an hour, knowing if I get torpedo, I'm dead in a matter of minutes. Yeah. Going through that stress every single day. 
and then all of a sudden you get into England and then you potty like someone doesn't know they're going to yeah. be alive next week. And then I turn around and say, how immoral, how could you do, how could you go out and drink, how could you run around with women? It's like, well, yeah. I'm 19 years old and I could be dead in 72 hours on a return trip. Yeah. I don't think people understand that. No. And so <clears throat> I'm getting on the soapbox, but, but I think that, that's important. People, yeah. if you, you haven't been there, you haven't put your life on the risk and you don't know if you're going to make it or not, yeah. who's going to be goody goody to shoe if they know they could be dead in a week? Right. And so I don't think people have a right to judge them morally on no. what they were doing. So I want to thank you and I appreciate everything you did. And I'll tell you, I care what you did. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So we're back. Another Marine. Yes, indeed. First and last. First and last. <laughs> we had quite a few Marines showing up. They're, everyone seems to be proud of being, in fact, their Marine. That's for sure. And you are, I can see by <laughs> your emblem. <laughs> yeah. So you want to tell our um, viewing audience your name? Yeah, I'm Stuart Carswell. I live in Keene. And on this Veterans Day, I want to say hi to my two daughters, Tina and Annette, and grandchildren. My son, Randall, who's down in Connecticut. And my two grandchildren, Hunter and Cassidy. And my great-grandchild, Noah. So <laughs> I hope they appreciate Veterans Day and go to the parade. I take them up to the parade as often as I can. And, and I think that's important because... I'm looking at it, there are actually families now in the, in the United States for the first time in our history that have no veterans whatsoever in their family. Where it was normally a rite of passage where a lot of 18 year old kids, they went to boot camp, whether it was the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, and when they <clears throat> were brought home after graduation, their father would take them to the local bar or VFW and <laughs> <clears throat> doesn't matter. You are now a man. Your had, brother and their uncle, uncle and the whole rest of the crowd had been in one service or another, another. over the years. You're right. And so, um, but people just, we're talking right now <clears throat> in Iraq and um, Afghanistan, less than 1% of Americans serve in the, in, the, in the military nowadays. Well, I'm not for war, for sure, <laughs> and I'm hoping that the president will keep us out of future wars. It's an unfortunate circumstance that you, just, you have to defend freedom, and we were the people who did it at the time. And the colonel remembers that. He was down in the second bridge company before me, I guess, or after oh, me. After, 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 after you, yeah. after you, yeah. yeah. I'm 76, and I'm one of the younger folks in yeah. the whole room. Because so. we had an 88, and 92, and not yeah. 85. Yeah. And every single one had been proud of their service. They did, and I... I I'm proud of my Marine Corps and all the other services. I'm in the Keene Senior Swingers here, which is a kind of a singing and theatrical group. And we have every service represented there. And regularly we sing all the hymns. So we all know each other and we're all here regularly and supportive of among our group too. But so, I started out in the Marine Corps, <laughs> same, same as you did, while well, you took a different route. Yeah. But I was in the uh, Paris Island I brought along a couple of photos. That's me <laughs> back in Paris Island way, way back in 1957. <laughs> I look pretty mean, don't I? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, they, they teach you to be mean at times, and unfortunately you have to do it too. But you got your chrome dome on. <laughs> and that's my dress blue because I wore them later on when I was in London, England on guard detachment at the Navy building in Grosvenor Square. That was tough duty, having to spend time in London, huh? Parades and parties, we called it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, before that, however, I did my time on the sea. I was in a fleet marine force, which FMF, was on yep. LSTs and tankers, and went over to Lebanon to Beirut in July of 1958. And thank goodness we only spent a week there. And then I went on a Caribbean cruise, and then back one more time to the North Atlantic, and then went to armorer's school to Quantico, was on the rifle pistol team at Camp Lejeune. And at that point, I was doing some routine field maintenance on 50 caliber machine guns, and I got a tap on the shoulder from my captain who said, 
they needed an armor over in London, <laughs> England, immediately. I said, wow, this sounds like a real good detail. I said, how'd that come about? He says, the last armor got deported. I said, wait a minute. How do you get yourself deported from a great job like that? He said, well, on New Year's Eve, his Marine Corps buddies got him drunk, put a Marine Corps hat on him, took all his clothes off, and sent him out on the balcony, <laughs> waving to the crowd. That'll get you deported. Yeah, and so... The Bobby down below put a spotlight on him, so he made the national headlines over there on that New Year's <laughs> Eve. And the Queen was not amused. She had, she had him <laughs> deported the next day. So I was on a troop ship going across the North Atlantic, just like that troop ship. <clears throat> and that is a rough crossing. It was in January, and we oh. were going up and down. We couldn't go on the decks. And we were the only Marines on a ship full of army guys going over to Europe. So the captain said, I want a Marine guard outside my door. So he got us mm -hmm. up out of the hold onto the decks. We were the only people who got on the decks for a while there. So he had his own personal armed Marine Corps mm -hmm. guard there. So we ate at the officer's mess and had a great time. But in England, uh, I got onto the detail which guarded the Navy building in Grosvenor Square. And that was a fantastic detail. I think I lucked out. It was all parades and parties and got to see Lord Mountbatten and do everything. And we were on the Admiral's special detail. And I was fortunate enough also to get on the Marine Corps rugby team, which played all over England, Europe, Wales, France, Ireland. And I was captain of that for two years. So we got our share of Guinness here and Guinness <laughs> somewhere, <coughs> something else somewhere else. So I think I had one of the greater, the greater <laughs> details of all the Marine Corps, other than having to do a few landings. Speaking of the, um, the rugby team, I was um, at Marine Corps Command and Staff College years ago, mm -hmm. and we had a Major Higgins from 4-0 Commandos. He was a rugby player, yeah. and we invited him to his house. And he says, hey, come here. We want to. He says, I got some pims. I go, and he goes, yeah, and he says, what's this? He says, I said, it looks like Kool-Aid, and it's got all this stuff floating around and everything. And I drink. He goes, oh, yeah, this is pretty sweet. You'll hit some up. Then about an hour later, it was like someone had taken my head and put it into my body with spinning, and it was a volcano going up. Yep. And I'm going, what's this? He says, oh, it's just Pims. <laughs> and I, <clears throat> for somehow, it didn't taste like alcohol or whatever, and it was just oh. like Kool-Aid. He says, oh, yeah, that's what these rugby players do after the game. I go, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we used to drink something called Shandy also, and that was a mixture of Watney's Pale Ale and <laughs> Ginger Ale. And everybody would drink that afterwards, and the guys after the game were in this gigantic hot tub the size of this room. It was like a <laughs> swimming pool, actually. And everybody's around the outside drinking beers, and they give us these saucy sandwiches, and it was a wild time. We had a great, great performance. But part of the detail was uh, I was sergeant of the guard, and we used to train all the Navy officers of the day in handling mm -hmm. weapons and everything. Well, one day we had this cocky kind of lieutenant come in and said, you don't have to tell me how to handle a pistol. <laughs> Next thing I know, bang, right, right through the ceiling, a plaster's coming down on us. And then he starts to shake, and he's got the pistol in his hand. So I, I, was, Please put I, it I down. reached over <laughs> carefully, and I said, I'll take that from you, lieutenant. You just sit down till, the, till your commanding <clears throat> officer comes and takes you away. And sure enough, he went off to get retrained, and I, yeah. here I am with the pistol, so... I took it, took it apart, took the cartridge out, gave it to, back to the commanding officer. He said, thank you very much, Sergeant. You saved the day. Because in the room right above that was the Admiral's headquarters, and it had come right through the floor up into his desk. But he was gone that particular yeah. hour. So, so <laughs> how long were you in the Marine Corps? I was in five years altogether. I went in originally for three. But the two years in England... But I'll take that. Yeah, you, I'm going to take an extension for England. <laughs> exactly. And so when you're in England, did you get to travel around Europe? Or yeah, you... I was also partially on um, pouch details. So we would go to Berlin and That's Naples, embassy pouch. Naples, yeah. yeah. And uh, Casablanca um, went to uh, Greece, Italy. <laughs> and we were also pulled in for other details.
over there, the Berlin Wall went up. So we were all put in uniform and had to go over and be on details there. And I was shuttled back and forth between Frankfurt and Berlin in the air to bring back people who had been smuggled out. And a lot of these folks, most of them were all Germans from East Germany, who had either come over the wall or under it, or just before it went up, they came across by the thousands. And we were bringing them out by train. And we had to arm guard them because the Russians were coming looking for people. Yeah. But then the trains got blocked and the roads got blocked, and the only way in and out was by air. And that was the Berlin airlift. Yeah. So we were on board those planes bringing refugees out and gardening the equipment going back in. Because the only way to get pouches and everything else in and out was to fly them in. So I spent a period of time on that. And I think I was lucky to survive because a few <laughs> of those planes didn't make it. But on the way into Tempelhof, we would all throw candies and things out the windows. And most of it landed over in the <laughs> East Berlin <laughs> side. <clears throat> and they were very happy, except the guards weren't very happy because <laughs> it was well, something that made a USA <laughs> signature on it. It didn't make things any better for a while there. But it, a lot of folks were happy to see the candy coming because they had no presents for the kids. It was snowy and it was awful and they were in just terrible shape. The um, <clears throat> when you sit here and you look at, at some uh, two pots that come across, here you are, 23, 24 years old. You're getting to see different parts of the world, different cultures, mm. most things that people just can only dream of. You, you're getting to grow up as an individual. Oh, You've got absolutely. more responsibility at 19 or 20 than some people are 40, 45 years old. Yeah. And then you're also playing a role in making people's lives better. The, the Berlin airlift, people don't always understand that. Mm. Bring in um, <clears throat> people, Japanese, I mean, j j slaves from refugees, from j refugees yeah. back to the home. You're making a difference, mm. you're playing a role. Yeah, we didn't always recognize that at the <laughs> time. We thought it was just another job. <laughs> Sometimes not, not that pleasant, but often we were just in terrible weather and odd hours and doing it 17, 18, 20 hours a day and sleeping on the plane and then having to be up in charge when you get off it again. And it's, I'd, shoot, it's almost, shoot, 97. So yeah, 13 years ago, I spent a whole bunch of time in, in Panama built, building uh, schools yeah. and drilling water wells and building roads. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're working around the hours, you're, you're sweating and you're, you're falling asleep and you're, <clears throat> your clothes and you're walking and you're getting all chafed from the, the dry salt and stuff. But later on, as you, it's done and over with, you go in yeah. and saying, you made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Kids are going to go to school that never had a chance. People are going to drink fresh water. So many things that we yeah. take for granted here. The military, especially the Marines, whether they... You, if I go back and look at pictures of Vietnam, you can have a Marines in brutal combat away city, and then the battle's over with, and then you can see Marines and corpsmen treating the, the kids, feeding yep. the kids. Helping the youngsters and Helping the, the, the youngsters and the wounded. Yep. And so the military isn't about just killing and destroying. Yeah. The military, in a lot of ways, have been ambassadors for the country and helping other people do better lives. Well, it gave me a role, too, and I appreciate it today because I still volunteer at the community <coughs> kitchen and here at the senior center. And I'm working now for home health care, <laughs> hospice, and community services, which is one of the better operations here, helping people who are homebound and keeping them in their own residence so they don't have to go to a nursing home or, or to public welfare <coughs> agencies. So the military gave me that thought of service first and self second and one of these days I'm going to retire <laughs> <laughs> me too my, <clears throat> my um, check that comes in every month says Lieutenant Colonel Roberts and I say the Marine Corps yeah. retired but I'm still doing a lot of public service well you're a community service you got elected again didn't you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the military teaches you that value yeah. It's, it's that teamwork. It can't be about me. It can't be about you. It has no. to be about us. Yeah. With us, especially in the Marine Corps, 
And I used to tell people when I went to the Marine Corps, I said, yeah, when the Marine Corps, the OCS, the first thing they do is get rid of the top 10% and get rid of the bottom 10%. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Mm. Well, the bottom 10% doesn't matter how much they try, they can't yeah, make they it. Just Unfortunately, the, the top 10 percent, so many of the egotistic and they always think about themselves. Yeah. We in the Marines are taught over and over again. The other service is the same way. Success is going to be based on a team effort. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and I want to thank all my service buddies who've done everything <coughs> before us and after us. And I do hope it continues from this day on. And so I want to say simplify. Semper Fi to you, too, Colonel. And <laughs> two days from now, yeah, we're happy, gonna birthday, go happy birthday on September, November 10th, our 235th exactly. birthday. Yep. And then November 11th is Veterans Day. Exactly. Yep. And so if you see a Marine, say simplify, happy birthday, Marine. And if you see a veteran, say thank you and say hello and thank you on Veterans Day and say we care. Yep. Get out and parade, and we'll see you up at the monument on Veterans Day, please. Okay. Well, thank you again. Yeah, my pleasure. You're okay, mine too. <laughs> well, welcome back. Um, I've hoped you enjoyed the interviews with all our military veterans, and <clears throat> especially I uh, hope you enjoyed that, that poem. That was a quite moving poem. And again, people are going to ask, who cares? When a serviceman asks, is who cares? The important thing that I would, important point that I would like to get across is, this is from my own personal view, is that a lot of times we see people saying, oh, thank you for your sacrifice, thank you for your sacrifice. Well, me, I cho chose to join the Marine Corps. I made that decision. A lot of these men and women that you heard today, they cho chose to make the decision to join the, the military. Some got drafted, others were said, nope, I want to go, I want to contribute. Military families make a great deal of sacrifices. They, <clears throat> their husbands, their wives are not there for important days, birthdays, births, deaths, whole bunch. They have to make sacrifices. They have to pick up the slack when the service member is not around. The service member makes the choice. He or she does what he feels is best interest of the country and their families. Because when you go in the dictionary and you learn the word sacrifice, sacrifice is something that you are forced to do, something that you don't want to do. These men and women who have joined the military, they made choices. They stood up. They made what they felt was the correct and most courageous choice to make. Did they want to die? No. Did they want to get injured? No. But they made a choice, and they, they took responsibility for their choice, and they held, it, held themselves accountable for their choice. If anything, instead of saying, I appreciate your sacrifice, say, you know what? I have high regard for your decision. I have high regard for the choices you made, because the choices you made have benefited me. It wasn't a sacrifice for them. They did what they felt was the right thing to do. So, again, from my personal view, don't tell me I made a sacrifice. Don't tell my fellow service members we made a sacrifice. Honor us for the decisions that we made. Thank you.